that so many of you have come out uh, to join us this evening. And uh, it, it's, it's really a, a wonderful tribute both to uh, our speaker and to the subject matter. But uh, also, to um, I, I wanted to recognize uh, Maeve's efforts um, as our membership coordinator. She's been working very hard to find new ways of getting the word out about our, um, our activities and uh, working with a number of people here at the Institute may develop um, a, an electronic uh, monthly newsletter called the e-tablet, which I hope many of you or most of you have received. And we just recently started, um, uh, we're going to be advertising our lectures in the, um, the Chicago Maroon uh, newspaper. And we just really welcome and want as many people from the campus community uh, it's possible to uh, to join us for these lectures in addition to our um, uh, our broader um, membership. So uh, thank you very much, Mary. And, and I think that it's a real tribute to your efforts. This this nice turnout. Yeah. Um, let's see. I first met our uh, speaker, I think, in 1983. 83, um, working in southeast Turkey in the Euphrates River Valley at a relatively undistinguished but still lovable mound called Ritala Uyuk, which is, uh, combines the Kurdish word for tell, for mound, uh, Greek, uh, the Arabic word for mound, tell, and the Turkish word for mound, Uyuk. So the site was called Mound, 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 which is how you do where to work there. Um, and I, I must say, it was a pleasure uh, to work with Anne on, um, um, we were working on later um, materials, and uh, it's, it's, it's been a long, long association um, on and off over the years. Um, I think Anne uh, Gunter exemplifies really some of the best things in um, our the study of the ancient Near East, which I like to think of as the confluence or the uh, conjuncture of three different ways of knowing about the past. And we know about the past through artifacts, through archaeology, the study of actual behavior and the, the residues of behavior. We know about the past through a second uh, pathway, and that is the textual record, and through a third pathway, that of images or art history. And one of the greatest strengths of the Oriental Institute has been that we're very committed to integrating those three complementary ways of knowing about the past to get a really holistic picture of the ancient civilizations of the Near East. And Anne, uh, his training is as an art historian, but she has very extensive archaeological um, background uh, as well. And, uh, and she uh, integrates those things very effectively um, in her own work. Uh, Anne received her, um, her BA from uh, Bryn Mawr and her uh, master's and PhD from uh, Columbia uh, University. She's been uh, very involved in the archaeology of two core areas of the Near East, or the, uh, the ancient, the study of the ancient civilizations of two core areas of the Middle East, Anatolia and uh, uh, Iran as well. She's been the director of the American Research Institute in, in uh, Turkey, ARIT, the Ankara branch. Uh, she's taught at, um, in departments of Near Eastern Studies at uh, University of California, Berkeley. Um, she's taught art history at the University of Minnesota and at Emory University. And then for, the, uh, for uh, a stretch of something like 21 years, uh, she was in Washington at the Smithsonian Institute where she held a curatorial position at both the uh, Sackler Gallery and the, uh, the Freer Gallery of Art. And uh, the Chicago area is very fortunate in that just last year, in, uh, well, two years ago now, in uh, 2008, um, she was hired as a professor of um, art history, classics, and the humanities at Northwestern University. And it's taken a year and a half to actually get her to come to 20 miles uh, <laughs> south of Memphis to, to a place where you can buy a drink. Um, anyway, uh, Anne's publications are very far ranging. She's uh, published on, um, on Gordian. She's published on the intellectual history of Near Eastern archaeology, particularly uh, Ernst uh, herself. She's published extensively 
on Iranian art as well, and on the Hittites. And uh, that latter topic is, of course, the subject of your lecture tonight, um, Tracking the Frontiers of the Hittite Empire. So please uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Ann Duncan. <laughs> First of all, um, thank you to the Oriental Institute uh, for this very kind invitation to participate in a wonderful lecture series. This is a premier institution for the study of ancient Egypt and the Near East, and a great uh, pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to Gil Stein for his very kind introduction, and to uh, Maeve Reed for her, all of her help with organizing the uh, lecture preparations. It is not true that this is my first visit here. Um, I, in fact, moved here at the end of 2008, and the first thing I did was to become a member of the Oriental Institute. <laughs> Um, and I will say at least once this evening and uh, probably afterwards many more times that the Oriental Institute was a major consideration in my decision to leave Washington after 21 years. It was such an enormous draw for me uh, to think about having this institution and its resources uh, of every uh, type um, uh, for someone in my field. It's a fantastic opportunity f for me. And what a wonderful turnout. I'm very impressed um, with this, all of uh, you coming this evening. Thank you so much for your interest. My focus, as you know, is the archaeology of the Hittite Empire, one of the great powers of the ancient Near East which at its height from around 1400 to 1200 BCE extended over a wide area of what is now the Republic of Turkey and into northern Syria. The rediscovery of this civilization through texts and material remains represents a major achievement of Near Eastern studies in the 20th century. As I, as I am sure you all know, scholars affiliated with or trained at the Oriental Institute played a pioneering role in the archaeological fieldwork and in this archaeological fieldwork and have long largely steered the study and interpretation of texts excavated at the Hittite imperial capital as well as the dissemination of that research through such extraordinary enterprises as the Hittite dictionary. Ongoing research by scholars of multiple nationalities continue to furnish significant new evidence for our understanding of the Hittite Empire and its territorial extent, for documenting its material culture, and for reconstructing how the empire functioned both politically and economically. We know in broad outlines the sequence of imperial expansion from the Hittite heartland in north central Turkey, where we will be spending, okay, this area, north central Turkey, and the approximate borders of imperial authority, and are now engaged in reconstructing a more detailed picture of the Hittite state. Where were the frontiers of the Hittite empire? Not only political, but also cultural. And how do we recognize them archaeologically? What degree of control in the realm of material culture was exercised from the imperial heartland of north central Turkey? In the last 25 years, archaeological investigations have dramatically increased and altered our knowledge not only of the Hittite capital itself, but the kingdom and empire as a whole. Let me begin briefly at the center and move gradually to particular sites on the empire's western and southern periphery, highlighting recent discoveries and ongoing investigations of which I have some firsthand knowledge of material culture and above all ceramic developments. Let me briefly set the stage for discussing current research on the capital and along the imperial frontiers an effort involving a wide range of sources, from inscribed tablets and monuments to metalwork and ceramics, and encompassing active fieldwork projects 
along with others conducted in museum storerooms. Anatolia, the term we often used for this area of what is now Turkey, came into the historical record early in the second millennium BCE, when both texts and archeological remains testify to a long distance trade in metals and textiles carried out between the city of Ashur in northern Mesopotamia, in northern Iraq, and a number of settlements in central and southeastern Turkey and North Syria. Around 1750 BCE, the Assyrian merchant settlements and local communities were destroyed and abandoned. About a century later, a people known as the Hittites established a new political order and established their capital city, Hattusha, today known as Boazke or Boazkale. Earlier the site of an Assyrian merchant colony and local settlement, Hattusha served for some 400 years as the capital of the Hittite Old Kingdom, founded around 1650 BCE, and Empire, which we generally date to around 1400 uh, to shortly after 1200 BCE. From this regional base in north central Anatolia, the Hittite kings gradually expanded their domains and came to rule over most of west of central, west central, and southern Anatolia. Shortly after 1200 BCE, Hattusha was destroyed. The reasons for the dis destruction of this and other Hittite cities and the subsequent demise of the empire as a whole are not well understood. Whatever the cause, the population was significantly reduced and the site never again supported a major city. A team of German archeologists began digging at the ruins now known as Boazke in 1906 and almost immediately uncovered clay tablets inscribed in cuneiform, the script invented in Mesopotamia and used for writing text in Akkadian, a Semitic language. Most of the newly discovered texts were written not in Akkadian, however, but in a, uh, as many of you know, but in a previously unknown language soon deciphered and recognized as Indo-European, the family of languages that includes Latin, Greek, Sanskrit, among others. This accomplishment enabled scholars to identify the archeological remains with the ancient city of Hattusha, capital of the Hittite state. The contents of the archive, archive are rich and varied. They contain texts in several languages and include royal laws, decrees, edicts, treaties, and letters, annals, chiefly narratives, detailed narratives of royal military campaigns, literary works, epics, and myths, and a vast number of religious texts relating to festivals, rituals, and incantations. In addition to cuneiform, the Hittites also employed a hieroglyphic writing system consisting of pictographic signs. This was a writing system invented in Anatolia and it was used on seals such as uh, in the uh, slide here and on large stone monuments carved with figural scenes. The language of the hieroglyphic script uh, is not Hittite, but Luvian, its close kin, also written in cuneiform script on tablets found at Hattusha. From their political heartland in north central Anatolia, Hittite kings ruled over an ethnically and linguistically diverse empire. At its maximum extent, Hittite influence, if not outright political control, reached into west central and southwestern Anatolia. The Hittites were one of the great empires of the ancient world, and their kings maintained active diplomatic exchanges with the Mitanni, centered in, centered in North Syria, centered in northern Syria and Mesopotamia, and with the other great powers of the Late Bronze Age, Egypt, Babylonia, and Assyria. In addition to rivalry and periodic conflict among the international powers, the Hittites had constantly to defend their borders, to defend their control and borders against threats and incursions within Anatolia itself. The military annals describe the repeated campaigns that kings felt necessary to conduct to maintain borders and consolidate political control, especially in the west, 
but the capital itself came under repeated attack, a, a threat from a nomadic group, the Kashka, who lived in the mountains to the north. In the reign of the King Muatali II, uh, who came to power uh, around 1300 BCE, the Kashka broke through the northern defenses to Hattusha itself, and the capital was temporarily moved to a place called Tarhamtasha somewhere in the south. This move perhaps also reflected the increased importance of the southern part of the empire in the wake of recurring conflicts with Egypt, which called for the need to oversee military operations from a location nearer the scene of battle. Until fairly recently, uh, as I mentioned earlier, our knowledge of Hittite monumental architecture and sculpture, as well as written records, came almost exclusively from the single site of Boazkre, the ancient Hattusha, located northeast of Ankara in uh, central Turkey. Those of you who have visited the site, you see an aerial view here, uh, will remember its dramatic setting, impressive scale, and remains of buildings of administrative and religious function, surrounded by monumental fortification walls pierced by a few elaborate gates with carved sculptural decoration. This aerial review, uh, view reveals the site's topography, rising in elevation from south to north, uh, and the three major areas, known as the lower city, there we are, it's magically come to life, maybe, um, the uh, citadel, uh, Biukale and the uh, upper city, which we will return to in more detail. Before we move on to the site, to sites on the empire's western and southern frontiers, I want to pause briefly at the capital to mention that here too, uh, investigations over the past 20 years or so have contributed dramatic new evidence for understanding the history and dating of the site. Some features have not changed since uh, you were last there, or since I was first there um, in the mid-1970s, I guess, uh, such as Temple One, the Great Temple, uh, in the lower city, uh, dedicated to the Hittites, two chief deities, the um, uh, weather god of Hatti and the sun goddess of uh, Arina. And those of you uh, also remember that uh, the Great Temple had a uh, uh, extensive um, a system of uh, store rooms and store uh, storage vessels uh, surrounding it. Here is a, a reconstruction of uh, the um, central building and surrounding areas and detail of some of the storage facilities. Just recently, the German team reconstructed a stretch of the fortification walls using as a guide a model ceramic tower tower vessel found at the site many years ago. This project was designed not only to enhance visitors' experience of the site, but also to research the details of wall construction, making of bricks, labor force, and time involved in the enterprise, and some of the more practical issues uh, of Hittite architectural practices. At a somewhat higher elevation at the site, on the citadel known as Biukale, are massive stone foundations hewn with harder stones or iron tools, which secured mud brick walls with timber framework for palace structures, in some of which the extensive archives I mentioned earlier were found. Here was the chief residential area of the capital for the king and his entourage. In the upper city, the, uh, the area known as the upper city, the higher ground above the palace citadel, early excavations revealed decorated gates piercing the uh, monumental fortification walls, the Lion Gate, the Sphinx Gate, uh, and the King's Gate, and four temples originally, or earlier, four temples, uh, similar in plan to the great temple in the lower city, 
uh, but much smaller in scale. And here is, this is my before picture for you. So you see what this part of the city looked like before uh, the renewed excavations of the late uh, 1970s with the remains of two of the four uh, temples that uh, were exposed in this part of the site. Beginning in the late 1970s, the German expedition turned its attention again to the upper city, the enclosed area occupying the most elevated part of the site in and around the Sphinx Gate. Within a few years, excavations exposed some 30 temples in this part of the upper city, and a monumental staircase and ceremonial road on either side of the Sphinx Gate. So here is a view of all of these temples of similar, as you can see, uh, plan and the Sphinx Gate, these ramparts extending some 250 meters in length uh, um, with the ceremonial uh, road um, uh, alongside. And here the uh, view of the monumental fortification walls and tower, bases for towers that you can see on top of the walls. Rather than an, than an area, constructed primarily for defensive purposes at the very end of the empire, it seems to have been a large and complex religious quarter with numerous temples of different dimensions but nearly identical plan, perhaps representing the incorporation into the cult center of Hattusha, the deities of other cities and people in the empire. For certain kinds of material, the site of, and information, the site of Boazcre has therefore been incredibly rich for Hittite archaeology, especially in its archives and in its spectacular examples of engineering and monumental architecture. But it is not the ideal site for every aspect of archaeological investigation. Construction of monumental buildings allow for comparatively limited exposure of layers underneath. Rooms and open spaces are the primary areas where we can expose uh, levels lying underneath these fortification, um, uh, these monumental uh, buildings. And layers are often disturbed by the massive building projects themselves. Finally, of course, the site only tells us about life in the capital and not what life was like elsewhere in the empire. What was the relationship of the imperial center to the rest of the empire, and how have scholars reconstructed the archaeological map of the Hittite state? Oh, here is finally our view then of um, the lower city with its great temple, the citadel uh, Biukale, and this um, uh, area, upper city, uh, whose picture has been so uh, fundamentally changed by the exposure of this uh, large quanti new quantity of uh, temples. And last but not least, um, near the uh, Hittite capital of uh, Abu Azkai, also the sanctuary of Yaza Likaya, uh, used as a, um, uh, a cult building, but also as a uh, funerary chapel uh, in the Hittite Empire, in, uh, carved with uh, reliefs, and we will be coming back to some of these reliefs uh, in a few minutes. The military annals I mentioned earlier often include narrative accounts of military campaigns, and place names mentioned in these texts some co can sometimes be precisely or approximately located. The continuity or survival of place names has also helped scholars reconstruct the location of cities and regions named in the texts. We can draw a map of the Hittite Empire's probable boundaries, but what did the Hittite Empire look like outside its capital city? Was there cultural as well as political unity? And how do we recognize Hittite material culture? Until recently, only a few settlements and cult centers outside Hattusha had even been identified. What little we did know, for example, uh, from the excavations at Al-Jahayuk on ta at Tarsus, 
and Alalak, modern Tel Achana, uh, all of which began in the 1930s, suggested that smaller cities emulated imperial fashions in architecture and sculpture, although on a much more modest scale. al not far from Hattusha, was one of the first Hittite sites outside the capital to be investigated, and it contained city walls decorated with figural relief sculptures and guardian gate figures, surely uh, connected to styles uh, established in the Hittite capital. Not far outside the bend of the Hullis uh, River, the Kuzul Ermak in north central um, Turkey, is the much more recently excavated site of Kushakla, ancient Sarissa, located farther east near modern Sivas, which likewise shows a layout and style of fortifications and temple architecture closely related to those of Hattusha. Elsewhere in Anatolia, Excavations carried out uh, chiefly for, uh, as salvage projects uh, contributed by chance information from areas that were archeologically very little known for any period of antiquity. That was true for the salvage excavations that took place along the Hittite, um, along the Euphrates River in the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Keban Dam project, uh, which um, uh, produced information on uh, sites of Korjutepe and Malatya. I can find these two, Are these here. This area of the uh, Euphrates. And later, um, the uh, 1980s Ataturk Dam project, um, including the site of Gritile, where Gil Stein and I first met, um, on the lower Euphrates. River. Only in the last 25 years have archives, Hittite archives, been found outside the capital, and now we have four such sites. Three are in north central Anatolia Mashhad Huyuk, ancient Tapika, uh, Ortake, ancient Shapanua, in the region near Boazke and Alaja Huyuk, and uh, Kushakla, ancient Sarissa, the site I just mentioned near Sivas. Finally, there is Tel Meskene, uh, or Amar, in the, um, uh, on the Euphrates River in what is now Syria. As scholars make progress in translating and publishing these newly available texts, we will have additional sources for understanding imperial administration and the relationship of these cities to the imperial center. It does already appear that the capital was in uh, close and frequent contact with areas even geographically quite distant from Hattusha and involved in a range of local activities. And we're going to come back to this issue in more detail uh, when we move to the sites on the empire's frontier. Cult sites associated with the Hittites have been found over a wide area of Anatolia, and many of these sites have been known almost continuously since antiquity. Uh, this um, map, um, in fact, um, shows the, the uh, triangles represent these monuments, um, sometimes freestanding monuments, sometimes part of a complex, uh, which um, refer to either to, hit, to cult centers or serve some other uh, purpose. They usually consist of a stone monument or natural rock face carved with a figural scene of which the best, uh, largest and best known is the sanctuary of Yazalakaya just outside uh, Boazke. They are found, as you can see, over a geographically uh, extensive area of Turkey and they are our richest source for the representational art of the Hittites. At least two, like Yazalikaya, are part of a sanctuary, and several of these have also recently been reinvestigated. Um, I'm showing you Gyaur Kalesi, west of Ankara, first investigated by an Oriental Institute expedition, um, where a, a site where carved reliefs of deities were associated with a processional way and cult buildings. Other monuments appear to have been set up to demonstrate political power and may therefore, and may be identified through inscriptions as representations of the kings themselves. 
In far western Anatolia, uh, not about an hour inland from the west uh, coast of uh, Turkey, are two monuments which are generally regarded uh, as monuments erected by local dynasts. Uh, one of these, uh, Karabel, uh, depicts a male figure in relief, uh, long known, but whose hieroglyphic Luvian inscription was reread and reinterpreted about a decade ago. We now know that it depicts the, the ruler of the kingdom of Mira, which coexisted with the Hittite Empire on its western uh, border. What is interesting here is that a local ruler chose a style and monument, uh, style of monument and writing that ape imperial fashions established in the Hittite heartland of central Anatolia, and thus to some degree, these monuments obviously also reflect Hittite cultural, if not political, influence. Another uh, site of this type, reinvestigated recently uh, and reconstructed, is this um, a monument known as Eflatun Pinar. It's not too far from Konya in the south uh, central part uh, of Turkey. I want to turn now to another aspect of recent research at the Hittite capital that while perhaps less dramatic than the monumental buildings uncovered in recent decades, might nonetheless have some of the most important repercussions for studying Hittite material culture as a state or empire-wide phenomenon. The stages of urban development and construction of particular monuments at Boazgre, the Great Temple, the fortification walls, the temple um, a quarter in the upper city, uh, were traditionally dated largely on the basis of events in the history of city of the city and the empire known from textual sources. In recent years, in conjunction with exploration in new areas of the site, radiocarbon dates have brought about a new archaeological chronology of building levels and associated artifacts. We now have a much more detailed local record of ceramic developments with which to compare with sites outside the capital. And this information is key to understanding the complex relationship between material culture and identity that clearly existed in the Hittite sphere. One of the most important categories of archaeological remains, of course, uh, is that of ceramics. The hard-fired clay vessels that are virtually indestructible and the only category of material remains recovered in large quantities from every ancient site. Early in the 20th century, a category of red uh, or brown slipped and highly burnished vessels in arresting shapes clearly inspired by metal prototypes, like this beak-spouted pitcher, was identified as Hittite. Such vessels in various shapes, including jars, teapots, we see on the left, uh, and other pouring vessels, were found at central Anatolian sites, such as Boazkre and Alajahuyuk, beginning shortly after 2000 BCE and continuing, although in decreasing quantities, uh, perhaps to the end of the Hittite Empire around 1200 BCE. From the early second millennium onward, these central Anatolian styles of red slipped and burnished vessels made their way into the ceramic repertory of wares and shapes of regions bordering the Kuzul or Mak, the uh, river of uh, central Anatolia and its basin on the west, uh, south, and southeast. Gradually, as other areas of the empire have been investigated archaeologically over the past few decades, we've recognized that a remarkably similar ceramic repertory is found at late Bronze Age levels, that is from about 1500 to 1200 BCE, over a wide range of Anatolia, and indeed follows a similar development over the course of the second millennium. Everywhere, including the Hittite capital, the pots gradually lose their red slip, although they continue to be made in virtually the same group of shapes, and a shallow bowl or plate becomes one of the most characteristic products. 
The clay is gritty and the pots are often strongly wheel marked, that is, uh, not even smooth of their wheel marks, and we are increasingly left with the impression of rather careless mass production. When the excavators of Tarsus came upon this pottery, they called it drab ware, and that is the term we still often use for it. What is remarkable about this phenomenon is that the same gritty, plain, or partially red-slipped pottery in almost exactly the same repertory of shapes and dimensions is found from west central to southern Anatolia, and its distribution seems to coincide with the political borders of the Hittite Empire. Note that this is not a fine ware in specialized shapes such as drinking vessels that might have been owned by and indeed served to characterize and distinguish a social or political elite, a phenomenon we can document in other ancient empires. This is a domestic repertory of vessels used for cooking and serving food and drink with every appearance of specialized and probably large-scale production. Is this a sign of cultural unity or unity in material culture within the Hittite Empire? Perhaps even evidence for a standardized ceramic industry introduced along with Hittite rule. If that was the case, how was it administered? And why was it necessary or even desirable? Let me take you to two sites on or near the empire's frontiers to show you this phenomenon and give you an idea of some current research concerns. Oh, well, my map should be here. Um, what happened to it? I'll come back to my map. On or near the western frontier, uh, the site of Gordian, which many of you know, modern Yasuhuyuk, located on the Sakarya River, about 100 kilometers southwest of Ankara. Many of you are familiar with the site as the capital of the Phrygian Kingdom that flourished later in the first millennium BCE. Excavations at Gordian have been carried out since 1950 by the University of Pennsylvania, producing evidence for a walled citadel of the Phrygian period and an extensive cemetery of tumulus burials, including the so-called Tomb of Midas. Gordian also produced evidence for earlier pre-Phrygian occupation, and although there has not been any large-scale exposure of these early levels, it is clear that the site was occupied in the period of the Hittite Empire. Excavations under the Phrygian tumuli or burial mounds in the early 1950s and again in the 1960s uncovered a cemetery with some 55 burials. While the skeletal remains were poorly preserved, the pottery included as grave gifts that you see, some examples of which you see here, was often intact or restorable. Jars, bowls, and pitchers in wheel-made buff and orange wares with red and brown, uh, usually partial slip, uh, such as you see here, showed parallels with pottery from central Anatolian sites, including Boazcre, and date the associated burials to the period of the Assyrian merchant colonies I mentioned earlier, and the Hittite Old Kingdom. So altogether around 1800 to uh, 1500 BCE. Apart from the corpus of Bronze Age burials, ceramics from the older excavations at Gordian, uh, the corpus consists of about 7,000 fragments, fragmentary vessels, recovered primarily from two deep soundings under frigid buildings on the citadel mound. You can see what a tiny area uh, of, of sounding was made into the levels. We're in the middle of a frigid Megaron uh, building on the citadel at Gordian, trying to find out what lay underneath. The value of the sounding lay in the fact that it uncovered a series of layers, probably floor layers, uh, without disturbance, and provided evidence for ceramic development over a period of nearly a 1,000 years. 
when I first worked on this material from Gordian about 25 years ago, the only site in north central Turkey with a comparably long ceramic sequence was Bozgre, the Hittite capital. Somewhat to my surprise, because it is a distance of several hundred kilometers from Gordian, nearly every type of wear and detail of shape and decorative treatment found at Gordian matched examples recovered from Boazkere. And the similarity in ceramic production continued throughout the Late Bronze Age, the period of the Hittite Empire. Although fragmentary, the ceramic repertory at Gordian was almost purely Hittite, by which I mean this group of gritty, buff, or orange wares originally covered with a red or brown slip and burnished, so-called Hittite pottery, which during the second millennium gradually becomes dominated by plain, uh, unslipped wares made in a narrow repertory of shapes. Shallow bowls or plates that I mentioned earlier uh, become the most common uh, vessel shape. And here are rim fragments uh, documenting uh, those very, very common plates. And we will see uh, more and more of those uh, in a few minutes. To judge by the ceramic parallels, uh, along with a clay bulla bearing hieroglyphic signs of old Hittite form, the settlement of this period at Gordian appears to have been situated within the Hittite orbit, perhaps on or near the western frontier during the Old Kingdom. The superposed layers clearly documented a gradual, steady increase in the percentage of wheel made uh, Hittite uh, wares and a parallel decline or decrease in the decorated versions, the red slipped versions, fashioned in a restricted range of shapes. Characteristically, the, the shallow bowls or plates, uh, narrow um, uh, jars with a narrow neck, um, uh, uh, and cooking pots, which are typical. Um, a feature of this ceramic complex. Here, are Hittite hieroglyphic seal impressions were also found, suggesting some official um, Hittite administrative presence or at least communication with Hittite centers elsewhere. Coupled with evidence for Hittite monuments in the vicinity, we're not very far at all from the reliefs at Gyaur Khalisi that I showed you a few minutes ago with the carved scenes of deities. The ceramic record in the soundings appeared to place late Bronze Age Gordian within Hittite territory, both culturally and politically. More recently, in the late 1980s, the University of Pennsylvania expedition resumed excavations at Gordian in a series of campaigns that included new exposure uh, of the late Bronze Age levels, and some very interesting results have come from the analysis of these newer finds. This looks familiar, uh, but better preserved examples. Technical study of the recently excavated pottery by Robert Hendrickson and James Blackman has established that at all stages, from clay selection and preparation to forming and finishing methods, firing temperature and conditions, the processes involved closely echoed those dominated at Boazkere. These careful observations are significant in defining and elaborating not only notions of ceramic tradition, but also of cultural choices in the manufacture of particular vessel types. For example, the animal-shaped vessels, show you a minute. The animal-shaped vessels you see at the bottom <clears throat> were formed in exactly the same way at Gordian and Boazkere. Considered in association, the results of both the older and the more recent excavations at Gordian suggest that nearly every aspect of late Bronze Age ceramic production was tied to specifications presumably established in the imperial capital. Only a small number of sherds from these levels at Gordian did not conform to the standard Hittite repertory. And they may be imports from Western 
Anatolia, from farther west, that is, areas beyond the Hittite uh, orbit. This makes me wonder if Gordian might have been situated on or near a frontier of some kind, and whether the presence of these imported sherds uh, reflected ongoing contact with other ceramic traditions, perhaps through interregional trade in foodstuffs, for example. In fact, a more recent study of the historical geography of this part of Anatolia in the Hittite period would place the frontier between the kingdom of uh, Hatti and the neighboring kingdom of Mira, not too far south of Gordian, perhaps in the area of modern Afyon, the modern town of Afyon in Turkey. So thus far, the excavations at Gordian have not produced all of the different types of ceramics we know from the Hittite capital. We are missing elaborate cult vessels, for example, along with fine wares probably imported from Cyprus that we now know made their way in rather impressive quantities even to the capital uh, at Boazkre. One explanation would be that Gordian's apparently simpler repertory reflects the settlement's peripheral status within the empire, or again, perhaps its uh, circumscribed role in a hierarchy of specialized production and exchange. For example, given the evidence for ceramic, uh, specialized ceramic production on a large scale, and, this, and the small size of other sites of this period in the area around Gordian, perhaps a regional distribution network for ceramic vessels was centered at Gordian or nearby, uh, judging by what I know, um, and the final publication of the new Gordian material may uh, change this, of course. Um, to, we can say that the extent uh, of wares does not match the richness and variety of those at the imperial capital. But it's still very hard to make comparisons when, as you have seen, well, we have exposed such limited areas of uh, Hittite Gordian, Hittite period Gordian. We probably need further exposure of these levels and ideally also to investigate another site of this period somewhere nearby. But the site's cultural orientation toward the Hittite heartland is unmistakable. Let me take you now to the other side of the Hittite Empire, uh, to its southern periphery along the eastern Mediterranean coast and the site of Kinet Huyuk. Some scorting again. We are, everybody sees where we are on the southern uh, coast of um, uh, Mediterranean Turkey. Kinehuyuk is located near the modern town of Dertyol on the Bay of Iskenderun. It is one of the largest mounds in eastern Cilicia. The um, name we give uh, for this region of southern uh, uh, Turkey in the classical period. And has been the focus of excavations under the auspices of Bilkent University in Ankara since 1994. In the late second millennium, this region of southern Turkey was known as Kizawatna, uh, a coastal polity contested by the rival kingdom of, of the Hittites, whose capital lay in north central Turkey, and of Mitanni, centered in northern Syria. This coastal region of the eastern Mediterranean, particularly its northeastern uh, uh, extent was arguably the Hittite Empire's window on trade with the Mediterranean as a whole. Documented in historical and epigraphical sources as a region of cultural fusion, whose population in this period included speakers of Hurrian and Luvian, languages represented in the text from Hittite Boazkre, Kizawatna was strategically positioned near the border regions of North Syria and home to the important port city uh, of Ura. Many scholars identify the site of Kinet Huyuk with ancient Issus, the site of a decisive victory by Alexander the Great over the Achaemenid Persian king Darius III. And the site has in fact yielded evidence for occupation with some interruptions from the mid third millennium BCE or early Bronze Age to the Hellenistic period. 
I wanted to show you another map uh, showing you this, um, how very narrow this coastal strip here is along the uh, Bay of Iskenderun, and also uh, by way of pointing out that this is in fact the only way to uh, gain access to the mountain passes if you want to go over the mountains uh, to the modern city of Antakya, uh, ancient Antioch, near where, of course, is Tel Tayanat, another oriental institute um, excavation. Now, when I say I work at a site on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey, people imagine all sorts of luxurious swimming beaches and quite a, quite a um, kind of holiday atmosphere uh, for an uh, excavation. Um, but those of you who recognize the name Dirt Yo, perhaps from other um, uh, aspects of modern um, Middle Eastern um, economic geography, uh, know that here lies the eastern terminus of the, uh, of the uh, former oil pipeline from northern Iraq to the Mediterranean, and now uh, serves for natural gas storage. Um, tankers are all uh, shore, um, uh, natural gas tankers, and the uh, area is now really covered with all of these natural gas storage um, facilities, um, so much so that uh, they really, of course, uh, to some degree endangered the uh, site of Kinet itself, which is barely visible, hiding behind this uh, row of storage vessels. Here uh, is the site. And here, uh, a view of the mound uh, itself. During the Middle Bronze Age, or early second millennium, Kinet's material culture was that of a typical northern Levantine town. Abruptly, around 1550, 1550 BCE, the Middle Bronze Age settlement was burned and almost immediately replaced by a settlement whose architectural features and associated assemblage, and above all its ceramics, closely resemble those at the Hittite capital Boazkre, some 600 kilometers to the north. A settlement of modest proportions at the southeastern border of Kizawatna, Kinet offered port facilities and a location in a geopolitically sensitive border region. Here is an aerial view of the mound just to show you of some of the uh, areas that were excavated, the late Bronze Age levels that produced uh, material related to, um, uh, to Hittite material culture known from other areas of the empires, located mostly here uh, in this area of the mound labeled EH and JL, and test trenches here and there turned up more uh, Hittite material, and also um, just off to the left of the screen, just north of the um, uh, site here, uh, is uh, an early Islamic settlement uh, that I wanted to mention because it will be excavated this summer by Asa Eger, a University of Chicago a recent PhD who will be um, uh, digging this early Islamic mound nearby. In this period, that is the late Bronze Age, the site consisted of a high citadel initially containing at least one large building of an official nature and a low-lying district enclosing a small harbor. And here is um, the top of the mound. Of the uh, layers labeled in red represent uh, periods 15, 14, and 13, the late Bronze Age or Hittite um, uh, material. Um, layers from the uh, site. This entire phase um, consists of these three uh, layers. And on the left, an example of some of the earliest ceramics that uh, came from um, the earliest period of late Bronze Age occupation, period 15, exhibiting, as you see, close similarities with both the red slipped and plain Hittite ceramics uh, known from the other sites I have mentioned. Kinet has produced substantial exposures of architectural remains from this period and well-preserved in situ deposits of ceramic vessels, uh, such as the um, group you see here. 
the overwhelming majority of late Bronze Age ceramics recovered from Cunet are of a utilitarian domestic nature, consisting of vessels used for preparing, storing, and serving food bowls, jars, plates, and juglets. You will immediately recognize the assemblage as remarkably close to the standard Hittite repertory of shapes and wares. Gritty, buff, and orange unslipped wares, that is drab ware, uh, in a narrow range of shapes dominated by the shallow bowls or plates here, uh, so numerous as to be uh, in stacks. Uh, and the same development we have seen elsewhere. Uh, over the course of this period, a gradual decline in the number of red slipped examples and parallel rise in the number of plain vessels. Only the presence of some imported, oh, here, sorry, I should tell you about, show you the plates, uh, some of them being uh, excavated it, as a stack. So we can reconstruct to some extent the inventory of a particular room. It's going to be extremely uh, useful in trying to figure out the typical domestic inventory. Uh, and this absolutely typical example of one of these shallow uh, bowls or, or plates. Sometimes they do have, this, there's a version, as you can see, uh, with a red slipped rim, um, but most of them are plain, as in the example that I just showed you. Only the presence of some imported ceramics, Canaanite jars, as you see on the left, used for transporting foodstuffs, and of fine painted vessels, mostly of Cypriot origin. These appear in very small quantities. These are the only indications that show any departure from the standard Hittite repertory that we know from so many other sites of this period. In the latest Late Bronze Age level appear small quantities uh, of the distinctive ware known as red lustrous wheel made ware, which many now believe derives from a single source in northern Cyprus and made its way in surprisingly large numbers uh, to sites in Turkey as far north as the Hittite capital. In 2006, we found a vessel handle with a hieroglyphic seal impression, unfortunately not well preserved, but showing as at Gordian that there was some interaction with Hittite officialdom along with a Hittite style ceramic industry. I mentioned earlier that the, te the technical study of Gordian ceramics that documents and analyzes in some in detail uh, evidence for the processes of clay preparation, forming, decorating, and production. These approaches offer a, new, uh, a newly refined and productive set of criteria for making comparisons among the Hittite ceramic assemblages from late Bronze Age levels at sites over a broad expanse of Anatolia. While visual inspection of the Hittite ceramics from Tarsus and Kinet Hiyuk certainly points to virtual identity with material from Boaz, Cray, and Gordian, we also need a more systematic and technically grounded survey of the nature and degree of similarity within and, be, and among the various assemblages. The increasing availability of radiocarbon dates will assist in this effort as more precise dates are assigned to the various assemblages now known from sites over this vast uh, region and whose description and analysis have now been so, um, uh, so enhanced by technical observations on various processes in the manufacturing sequence. Archaeologists have speculated about how this kind of standardization could have been accomplished, perhaps through centralized, uh, centrally supervised instruction to local craftsmen. But even without the benefit of such detailed uh, or quantitative data, the standardization of ceramic production in late Bronze Age levels over a wide expanse of Turkey is remarkable and undeniable. It is manifested in the circumscribed, mass-produced repertory of wares and shapes, very likely also in manufacturing parameters, as I mentioned earlier. 
How this might have been achieved is now the subject of lively debate and discussion among archaeologists working on this material in all areas of the Hittite world. Was there a systematic, centri centrally controlled dissemination of production techniques along with the prescribed and standardized repertory of shapes and wares? Some have sought clues to this line of investigation through the vessel marks preserved on some examples. At several sites uh, within the Hittite heartland or along its frontiers, these sites include Boazkre, Alajahuyuk, Tarsus, Gordian, and Korjatepe in, um, uh, in the east. Late Bronze Age ceramic vessels of this Hittite group bear graffiti in a limited number of marks or signs always in size before firing and generally, although not entirely consistently, placed on easily visible parts of the vessel. Here are some examples from recent um, uh, uh, seasons at Kinet Huyuk. One recent study of these vessel marks in fact, in in fact incorporates some of this new evidence uh, from Kinet where a sizable number of examples have been recovered along with what seems to be a larger repertory of signs than is known from most sites. What did the graffiti signify and to whom? One interpretation is that the marks designated, is that the marks designated the individual or workshop products of potters using communal work facilities, such as kilns, in order to calculate each unit's eventual payment or other compensation. In this interpretation, the practice of marking vessels using a similar and restricted vocabulary of signs along with the ceramics, but no examples of pot marks, suggesting that these marks might also reflect other aspects of ceramic production. The range of processes that was carried out at, at a particular location, for example, or those, process, those processes which involved use of shared resources or production facilities. Here we could turn for at least theoretical assistance to similar practices of marking vessels in a range of societies worldwide. Often these kinds of marks distinguish individual or workshop products, often those of the producers, within communal facilities, as I mentioned earlier. In many or most cultural spheres, these marks typically also appear discreetly on the underside of vessels or in other inconspicuous places, whereas the pot marks from most Hittite period sites are instead placed in conspicuous locations and perhaps specifically where they would be most visible while the vessel was in use. It is this typically visible or conspicuous placement of the marks that makes me wonder whether vessel use oh, might, um, uh, oh dear, just find the last page for you. Whether vessel use. Uh, as, a po as opposed to or in addition to processes of manufacture or distribution played any role in this phenomenon. So that is to say they're not necessarily directed only towards pre-manufacturing considerations. The limited repertory of, sh of marks we have now uh, in itself certainly suggests centralized directives whether of production or distribution, and the standardized nature of the ceramics themselves further argues for centralized production specifications. If the products of state-regulated kilns uh, and workshops made their way outside the boundaries of Hittite imperial control, we might expect those sites to show an assemblage dominated by a local tradition, but including a component of the official Hittite repertory. So in the Hittite empire, we see a widespread homogeneity in the repertory of ceramic vessels and shapes, perhaps wares and shapes, 
and perhaps also a standardization of manufacturing processes. This suggests, among other things, that the effective functioning of the empire required significant intervention in the ordinary activities of populations housed in settlements ranging from towns to large cities. A fascinating phenomenon has emerged from, this, from these recent studies. This archaeologically seemingly elusive imperial power, whose material remains were scarcely recognizable to archaeologists a few decades ago, seems to have operated a highly centralized and regulated production over a vast geographical expanse and among sites quite varied in scale, economic activities, ethnic composition, and strategic importance. What were the goals of this imperial control, and how was it decided to expend resources on such a scale? I think that some important clues will come from more detailed studies, both typological and technical, so we can really begin to assess similarity and difference among large assemblages at various locations in the empire. Surely this control must speak also uh, more broadly and more profoundly about the relationship between material culture and Hittite identity. And I hope that I've persuaded you that this is a very exciting time to be in the field of Hittite studies. Thank you.